Welcome everyone to the Change Starts Here podcast. I'm your host, Dustin Odom. And in this week's episode, we welcome Phil Boyd, who is the author of School Culture by Design. Uh, the, the biggest takeaway I can share with you today, uh, as you're considering listening to this, this interview, um, his, one of his favorite mantras here is people first, professionals second. Phil spends all of his time going around to schools and districts all across the country, reminding them that we are people first. And it seems crazy given that educators have huge hearts and love people well, but it's something that is, we've got to fight to remind ourselves every day because all of us as educators can identify the time that we've uh, sacrificed maybe some joy with our family or friends to do the work of loving and serving our kids. And so his goal is to create cultures where there are genuine connections, where people care for each other deeply, not just the news, weather, sports conversations, but are really invested in each other's lives, no matter how big the school is. And what I appreciate about my conversation with Phil is he's very much about practical advice. If you go Google Phil Boyd now or later, you'll you'll notice really quickly he's got blogs. His blogs have really practical advice and things that you can take immediately and go implement. Um, he's got his own podcast. And when you listen to him, he is uh, focused on things that you can implement right away. And he's got a great YouTube channel, which again, with little snippets that uh, you guys can uh, take quick advice and go implement right away. So I appreciate uh, his thoughts on practical advice, but ultimately the people first, professional second is something that I really appreciate about him and his passion for encouraging schools to build the connections for adults to know each other, love each other and serve each other. It's an awesome conversation. He's so genuine. He's funny, very thoughtful, very energetic, very passionate, and again, very practical in his advice. So I hope you guys enjoy this conversation as much as I have. Um, again, if you subscribe, we appreciate your support. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. We, we want as many people support this podcast as possible and to continue to make it grow. So we thank you. Uh, and again, enjoy this conversation as hope, again, hope, hope you enjoy as much as I did. Well, Phil, thank you so much for making time for us today. Appreciate you joining us. Dustin, it's a thrill. I love Leader and Me and I love the organization. So this is a real privilege. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So as you know, our first question is the same for everybody. Who are you and what do you love about what you do? Hey, you know, I'm first, I'm a husband, I'm a dad, um, and I'm a grandpa now, which I can't hardly believe because I don't, I don't feel like I'd, I'd be old enough. I don't walk around feeling that, but I've got five little grandkids and, and I love it. It's, uh, it's a cool part of my life. And what do I love about, I love to connect people. I guess that's my superpower. I think we all have a superpower and whether it's in my neighborhood, whether it's in the work I do, I like to take people, give them an opportunity to connect because so many cool, cool things happen out of those connections. So that's, uh, that's one of the things that I love to do. When, when did you know that you were a connector? I'm, I'm sure I've read some books over time that talk about, you know, are you a connector? Are you a influencer? I, I don't know. I don't know the different words or terms right now, but when did you know that that was one of your superpowers? You know, that might've been one of Malcolm Gladwell's books where he talked about connecting. Yes. With, yeah. Uh, yeah. Remember he put a label to it. And I'm like, yeah, that's me. Cause then there's people who are, they, they, collect all this knowledge. You want to know what car to buy. They're like, buy a 2014 Toyota Camry with 30,000 miles. That's not me. I'm not that guy. I'm the guy that says, you know what? Hey, you and you ought to meet because both of your wives have cancer right now and you're lonely and you're struggling. And I think it'd be benefit, you know, just whatever those little things are. And I just realized, yeah, that's me. Yeah, there was a, it was a Maven connector and salespeople, if I remember correctly. That was one of my uh, favorites to go through that. So uh, just a quick question. I mean, you're, um, you're incredibly influential in the, the world of education. And I'm just curious, before we dive into why that is, what's been your experience within education? What's been your, your work history within education? And how'd you get passionate about education? You know, when I was in high school, uh, literally, it's a funny story. I was, we had a leadership class in 1977. Um, and they, the student, student council advisor said, who would like to go to this little leadership conference next week? And I asked the kid next to me, do you get out of class? He said, all day. I said, sure, I'll go. Having no idea that simple little question. Because I'm a little jock, you know, I was going to play three sports. I was doing all that. And so <laughs> I went to this conference. I heard this speaker went, wow, that was awesome. So I got involved in this organization. My senior year of high school, I got this scholarship to go to Sacramento Board of Realtors, had this series of speakers. 
Dennis Whaley, Tom Hopkins, all these uh, Zig Ziglar. And I was like eating it up. I said, I want to do that someday. So with that leadership stuff I was doing through California student councils and this speaker thing, I said, that's what I want to do. I went up to Chico state, little small university, Northern California, ran into an activities director who kind of mentored me a little bit, got me speaking. And all of a sudden I realized I, I love this. And so I started doing school assemblies at first and then leadership conferences, and then a principal say, hey, my teachers need some of this. In 1992, I created Link Crew, where you link successful seniors to incoming freshmen. And that was just nine. First year, I trained nine teachers to do it at their schools. When I sold it to my friends at Boomerang Project, we were training 650 teachers. I think they're training 2,000 teachers a year now. Um, then we had a school shooting in Marysville, California, 92 or 93, and they call us and we need help putting our culture back together. Kids are afraid of each other. And so we created Breaking Down the Walls and it has blown up. Um, we normally do about 300 days a year all over the, the world. And we just sold it to some of our partners that have been doing it for years with us because I just need to move on to some other things and they're going to probably have the biggest year they've ever had. So that's just a little, I got my teaching credential when I was at Chico, but I never chose to teach after student teaching. I said, I'm going to do this leadership stuff. And about six, seven years ago, I wrote a book called school culture by design. And all of a sudden people are like, Hey, we need some help. And I'm like, I'll tell you what I know. I don't know that much, but I'll tell you the little bit I do know. So. Yeah, we're, we're definitely going to dive into that. Um, you know, on a, on a sober moment that I, I didn't really think we would get into uh, you, you talked about how you got brought in, uh, to help with the school community after a school shooting. We just experienced another one in our country. Yep. What what are those lessons that you've learned or that uh, what are the things that you brought to that school community to help them heal uh, and to move forward? You know, it, it happened with Columbine as well. We had trained a couple of their staff the week before the shooting. And so they reached out to us pretty quick and I realized, especially back then, I didn't know anything. You know, I was a 35 year old kid. I thought I knew something. Well, now I'm 60. I realized I still don't know anything. <laughs> and what I realized, people just want to feel safe with one another. And the whole idea of breaking down the walls is give students a structure and a positive way to talk and listen to each other's stories. When they start to realize they have more in common, they have differences. One of the things I like to do with their partners is say, hey, tell them three things about your family that you think are different than their family. And then when you get done with that, tell each other two things that you think your families have in common. And they start laughing like, no way, you put peanut butter in your pancakes, that's gross. Or you guys watch TV together at night, that's so cool. Or, And all of a sudden, there's this connection, reconnection. So I think after these acts of violence, especially at the high school level, when these kids come back, there's this nervousness. And they want to feel safe. And they want, and, and I think most of them realize that, you know, that person is probably not going to hurt me physically, but emotionally, am I protecting myself? And it just gives them the freedom to go, oh, we're okay. And it just makes it a safer place. Because really, if you think back, even when we were in school, I was afraid to raise my hand because the kid behind me might say something stupid. Yeah. Well, if I have a relationship with the kid behind me, he's not going to say something stupid. He's going to go, thanks for asking. I had the same question. And that's what we want to do. So did you, you just mentioned the book that you wrote, um, about you know school culture by design is that has that culture piece been a passion of yours the entire time or is that something you grew into of recognizing like that is so important that I've got to spend time writing a book for this I think what happened was it, I, I've been a connector by nature my whole life when I was in school I wanted to connect kids and stuff like that um, and all the work I've ever done is about connections and so the culture thing kind of came out of it. When I trained people in Link Crew, it was a three-day event. We all shared. Everybody had their own place to sleep, but we all had shared meals. So we had amazing conversations. So I was hearing stories about culture from early 90s on and on and on. Well, I read a book called The Advantage by Ted Lincioni, and he talked about, you know, culture is something that a lot of people think is beneath them. And he asked, it sounded like he was talking to the CEO of Southwest Airlines. He didn't name the company. And the guy says, well, the reason other companies don't do it is because they think it's beneath them. And yet it's what makes us so successful. And so you think about it, I think even in education sometimes, well, we don't have time for that. And so I've created some new products called people first leadership where let's be people first, let's be professionals second. 
you mm-hmm. and I, before we ever started this podcast, what we found out we had in common was golf. We started talking about golf course. You're like, yes, I want to play that. I have played that one. And we had this thing in common that just came out of some simple little thing. Well, I think the same thing, whether we're in education, whether we're in the business world, we're in technology, whatever, in healthcare. It, my daughter does this thing with people. She was getting ready to have some surgery. And she said to the surgeon before he put her under, I just want to know one fun fact about you. He goes, what? She goes, what's something about you that most people never know? He says, well, I was in a garage band with my friends when I was in college. It was the highlight of my college. And she goes, what? That's awesome. What was your favorite song? And he said, Stairway to Heaven. And they laughed. She said, just before she went out, she heard him go out because the anesthesiologist could knock her out. She hears him say to the nurses, that was so cool. I haven't thought about that in years. And she did it with the kid at Target the other day. It was developing and putting her food in the back of her car. She goes, wait, for every delivery person, I want a fun fact. The kid goes, what? She goes, tell me something fun about you. Kid goes, I have 50 vinyl records. I have these vinyl collections I'm trying to build up. She goes, like, like that you put on a record player? He goes, yeah. And for three or four minutes, and she said, same thing. She's driving off. He's telling the kid, push the carts. That lady asked me about my vinyl collection. Three minutes, five minutes, and guess what happens? You know, so if we take the time to say, hey, we're people first, we're professional second, we start to relax, we have a higher level of trust, we have a deeper level of engagement. And I think so often, well, we don't have time for that. Well, when are we ever going to have time for it? Yeah, I think, so that was some. so first off, uh, is this the same daughter that uh, you told the story about the cookies? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's great. That's yeah. a, that's a video that everybody. I, I went down a YouTube craziness oh. with uh, your with the the videos. I appreciate. I mean, there's some longer ones, but most of them are like pretty quick snippets with really good uh, uh, lessons. And so I just encourage a lot of folks to to check it out. I mean, this one about cookies, just because it was so simple to remember, it's all about taking initiative. But I just I it was a really good, clear illustration about the power of initiative and looking for opportunity. And so same with this, it's, I want to connect with people, asking them for a fun fact is a good way to figure out like what's important to those folks, but also what's unique to those folks. Um, What holds people back? I figure like, I feel like in education, you would like to think that people get an education, uh, people first, professional second is just a mantra that most people feel, but it's not. It seems to have like either been taken out of them or for some reason is not on the front burner, what what are the challenges to having people in education live that way and build cultures that way? Well, I'll be honest. I mean, I can, I can zip around this, but those are my listeners may hold us against the rest of my career, which may not be much longer. But I think 10 or 15, maybe 20 years ago, we got so focused on student achievement, data, whatever we want to call it, that we started hiring people who that was their superpower. That was their strength measurables and all that. Well, when you start to do that, then those people didn't want to surround themselves with other people who are really good at that as well. Okay, good, bad, or otherwise, there's been this trend that says, hey, achievement matters. I absolutely agree. We want our students to be prepared to compete in the world, to be ready. And yet, those of you watching on video, there's a balance. I think that if our race for student achievement gets too out of balance from culture, then it collapses on itself. Yep. If we keep them steady and even, there's a balance. Well, I believe that a lot of teachers are afraid if I take the time to build community in my classroom, my boss is going to come by and say, how is this helping us achieve higher numbers? Well, the, the teachers, either veterans or that believe in this, they're, they're not worried about it. They're like, I know by the end of the year, the numbers will be fine. Our achievement will be fine. I'm going to build community in my classroom because then I don't deal with all the problems. I don't deal with the knucklehead who's inappropriate because his classmates say, hey, shut up, man. Don't do that here because they know this class is different. This class is valuable. And so I think there's a balance. I think that's why there's a lot of students who are having so many social emotional issues. Um, It's not the teachers who's not doing his fault, but I think there's so many places that they don't just get to be accepted for who they are. So if it's a teacher takes 20 minutes a day the first week or two of school and builds a base of relationships in class where every student has a relationship with five other students in their class kids want to be in that class they want someone to say hi to them when they walk in we had a girl in rogers oklahoma after a workshop just she just said i'm gonna start taking my airpods out when i walk into class i'm like why she goes when i have my airpods and i'm telling the class i'm not available and she goes i want to at least say hi to the kid next to me i just want to say hi to the teacher And so when people become aware of that, that doesn't take any time. That's just a gesture that says, hey, I want to be here. 
And yes. so I think I think that's that that's some of the stuff is give staff members permission and then give them some tools, some activities they can use. When you think about some of the most inspiring schools that you've seen or you've written about, what are the cornerstones of the design in which they build their school on, uh, especially to try to build a people first, professional second uh, culture? Uh, yeah, I think of Dr. Eric Chagala down at Vita Middle School. In my book, I highlight him a couple of times. He just, it's, it's getting better and better. And so many people go watch his school. And he's under, he's not a Ron Clark. He's not a Robert Louis Stevenson. You know, there's so many schools that have these big followings. He's just this quiet guy. I was at his school doing Breaking Out of Walls six, eight years ago. And, and uh, we're talking at the end of the day. And a kid walks up and says, Dr. Chagala, what are we doing tomorrow? He goes, I don't know why. He says, I can't wait to get back. And he takes off. And he looked at me and said, that's the kind of school I want, like a summer camp where kids can't wait to get back. That's not about math, science, and English. That's about the relationship they have with their teachers, with the school monitor, with the lunch person, bus driver, with their classmates. That's this feeling of, I like it here. I feel safe here. I belong here. Well, I think about the Auburn Riverside High School up near Seattle. It's a larger school. It's a high school. And high schools are so dynamic with sports and drama, all the stuff that goes on with schools. And, you know, you walk in that campus, you're just like, there's something going right here. Well, because they're really intentional about spending time connecting with people. Lockport High School near Chicago, same thing. They're superintendent, they're principals. They're doing these little things that say, hey, I see you. I care about you. You matter to me. And I think those are some of the things that, you know, I love the, the idea of door jam conversations. A buddy of mine, Paul Lumberg, says, I spend 20 to 30 minutes every morning when I get to school and I just take my coffee and I just go try to catch as many staff members as I can. I just stand there in, in their doorway for 30 seconds to two minutes and just ask them something personal. Hey, didn't your daughter have something? And, oh, didn't your son, uh, hey, how, didn't you get a new car? He said something just to say, hey, I'm here. Anything I can do to help you. You know, those door jam conversations seem, seem so simple, but that's when people go, hey, I was going to ask you. Great. I don't know the answer now, but let me circle back to you within 48 hours and tell you what I can find out. Pass yeah, there, those I trust. As you're talking, I, I feel like if there are any educators who don't know who you are or if they know who you are, but haven't spent time on your blog. One of the things I appreciate about your blog is. Uh, it's 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 like a bunch of examples of what you just gave there. It's, hey, here's the challenge. Here's something you can do immediately with your staff or on your own to reflect and get better. As you think about, you know, the impact of your blog or just things that you've gotten feedback over time, are there a couple of exercises that people just continue to come back to thinking, Phil, like, thank you for spending time sharing. The, I mean, they're all really good, right? And it, depending on like, where someone's head or heart or experience is, they're going to be drawn to one. But I'm curious if you have one that just keeps coming back that people are like, thank you, Phil, for sharing that. You know, it's funny. One came up yesterday, the day before I was doing a podcast. We have one called School Culture by Design. And I had JJ, who worked for me for a couple of years. He's just finished his second year as a principal, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. And he said, Phil, man, he said, um, Moonshot really worked for us this year. I'm like, how did you guys use it? Because it started in Southern Oregon. A principal's having a hard time getting his attendance up. They were 82% trying to get in the 90s. So he said, once or twice a month, he just yells over the loudspeaker, 350 kids, Moonshot in the cafeteria, five minutes to be there. The whole school comes down the cafeteria. And up, it's one of those cafeterias that has a stage. And he has a basketball hoop, just those little kids' basketball hoops. Not the little tiny one, but it's about six feet up. And he yeah. says, it's got a Nerf basketball. And he says, I call out a kid's name. Five different kids get their name pulled. And he said, they get to shoot this Nerf basketball at the hoop. And if they make it, they get $100. Well, you can imagine what kids are thinking. Give me the, give me the, well, he said after about the third one, he said, I realized the cafeteria leaders were loving on this. The, the bus driver had come in. So he said, I threw their names in there too. And so the first time I called the cafeteria later, the kids went crazy. And he said, it was so fun. Well, JJ, he has 150 students at his school because it's only two years. You know, freshmen, sophomores right now, it's a brand new school. He said once a week, they have a all school assembly. Everybody comes in and talk about a few things. And we do moonshot every time. I call out five kids' names. They get three shots. And he said, I start with 20 bucks. He says, if you miss it, now we add five bucks. You miss it, another. So he says, the most I've ever had to give a kid was 65 bucks. But the kids absolutely love it. Well, 
kids, you, you pull their name if they're not there, their friends like, oh, because they don't get a shot. And they toss the name out for the next month and then they throw them back in or something like that. But it's little things like that, that, you know, there's a book called The Power of Moments by the Heath Brothers. Yep. And they talk about, you don't remember everything, but there's these little moments that you, that you, they're anchors you remember. And oftentimes at the beginning or at the end, JJ said last week, Friday was last day of school. Half his students were still on campus at 430 and after they didn't want to leave. <laughs> he said, we talk about one of the themes I use a lot in my talks is creating a school that no one wants to leave. He goes, dude, they didn't want to leave. And he says, my daughter's 12. He said, when she gets the opportunity to go to my high school, I hope she will. And he said, how cool would that be if she doesn't want to leave last day of school? I want to stay here because it's been so great. Yeah, we were we were blessed. You talked about uh, Chip and Dan Heath. We had Chip Heath on recently and just like, Again, their sincerity, their research behind what they do. I just, I love their work. Power Moments is one of the ones that really influenced me as well. I think uh, something else that you just said that describes you, like when I think about Franklin Covey's work with Leader and Me, you know, I, I come from a school turnaround world where it was data, data, data. Um, and for me, the it's not, you know, Leader and Me or the schools you're talking about aren't running away from data, but uh, people ask me like, what's different? What's unique? I'm like, well, it's a school. As soon as you walk in, you know, Lighthouse School for us is a school as an educator, you know, you want to work at, you know, yeah. you want your kids to go there and any other kid that you can think of. And so when you think about the key attributes of a school that no one wants to leave, what are the three to five key attributes that you just walk in and know that they are doing so clearly that everyone else should be doing these things? Well, think about these Three words. What does it look like, sound like, and feel like? Yep. When you walk through the halls, what do you want your student's sound to be like? I want them to be laughing. I want them to be giggling. I want them to be high-fiving. Christiana Krause was principal at Paramount High School in Southern California. Tough neighborhood, 3,000 kids. She said, we're not going to have earbuds. And she said, it takes a long time to get high school kids to put their AirPods away. She said, every day I'd have a hundred kids. I have to go, Hey, remember safety. And it was just, she says, I want kids to enjoy each other, walk in the halls, hanging out at lunch. If they got AirPods in, they're not here. So I'm, I'm, when I walk on a campus, I'm listening to the noise. I love the chatter of kids, whether they're elementary kids. I was interviewing a, a principal in Atlanta, Georgia. And she said, yeah, one of the things that we do every once in a while is a, a school dance party. I'm like at an elementary school, how's it work? She says, well, I just get on a PA and once I say, it's dance party. And the kids jump up and I play a song. And the kids run to the hallways and they dance. I said, how long? Like three or four minutes? She goes, no, 45 seconds. She goes, they have so much fun. And I said, what do the teachers do? She goes, I told them they got to dance too. At first they're like, no way. But you think about the energy that you feel in a healthy campus, the noise. What do the teachers look like, sound like, and feel like? My buddy Tim Lyles in an interview, he was principal at Sunnyside High School in Fresno. I saw this interview, the TV lady, she said, Mr. Lyles, she says, when I walked to campus, it felt so different than where I went to school. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, everybody's friendly. Students open the doors for me. They smiled at me. They, they were happy to see me. And they don't know me. I'm not the person who's up on the screen on TV. I'm just with the camera guy. Yep. She goes, why is it that way? He goes, well, if you want to know why students behave they would, the way they do, look at the way the staff does. He said, I tell my teachers all the time, if you open doors, kids open doors. If you pick up trash, kids pick up trash. If you say hi, kids say hi. So I think that's another mark is there's a quote I use a lot of times, you know, if mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. But if the staff isn't happy, so... I would encourage a school leader to spend a lot of time on staff health. Well, I've never been in a place where the kids were healthier than the, than the staff. I, I think that's a phenomenal point. And right now, you know, my, my main role is I travel across the country and work for Franklin Covey Education. So I'm in schools and districts often. And yeah. whether it's Florida or Minnesota or anywhere east to west, yeah. uh, superintendents and principals right now are all worried about their own burnout as well as terrified about the burnout of their people. Yeah. What advice do you have or what have you been helped? I know that you're, you know, no one has the answer. I'm just curious because you've you engaged in these sincere conversations with folks. What advice do you have to help folks work one through their own burnout and challenges, but also two, their to how do we, how can we love our staffs really well to be able to fight through their own burnout? Well, I would say this summer, um, 
tell people, I, I, I love, I'm in a cohort with a group of administrators. And one of them said, I told my staff, when summer break starts, I do not want to communicate with you unless we have an emergency. He said, for the month of July, I am not going to email you. I'm not going to call you. I'm not going to anything. You have that month off. He says, you've got to restore yourself. you got to take care of yourself because if you don't, you're going to, by October or January, yep. well, I asked him, I said, how about you? He's the same thing. I do not want to hear from them unless it's emergency. He says, I'm not using my phone hardly at all. So I think number one, you got to model it. You got to talk to your staff about what does health look like, sound like, and feel like? Because if you only take a week off and some of you are going to have to argue with your superintendent or your director, whoever, say, wait, I got to get myself healthy. A lot of people have been thinking about staff, but they're not thinking about administrators. So if we can have whatever that means to you, whether it means you're going to the beach, whether you're going camping, whether you're just going to lay on the couch. I talked to a principal in Raleigh recently. He said, yeah, my wife and the kids are doing spring break at the beach. I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm laying on the couch. If I go there, I'll get caught up. I said, seriously? He said, I might join them halfway. So I got to get healthy. So I think, number one, then once the school year starts, I think if you have this people first mentality of you spend as much time focused on supporting your people's health as you do focusing on supporting the district numbers. Mm. Because, and I, I don't want to ever diminish the importance of we've got to improve our data, improve reading scores or whatever. But at the same time, if you as, and some of you as administrators, that's not your superpower. You've got to say, OK, how do I write on my list today? I'm going to check in with five people before 10 a.m. Mm. I'm going to check in with three people at lunchtime. I'm going to check in whether it's five minutes, two minutes just to say, hey, what can I do to support you? And listen to them. And they'll tell you in two minutes because they think they'll never see you again. So they'll talk fast. If you're a side administrator, you know what I mean? They're, they're just like, because they think they won't see you for three months. And they'll tell you and if you or the people who support you can support them. And most time it's in some little way, they're going to go, oh, wow, she supported me. He heard me. And if someone feels like someone heard them, oh, they feel safe. That's so true. It's funny you said that they, they're worried they may not, especially in a bigger high school, they're worried they may not see you for three months is so true. Uh, I, you know, I, I think I was in a, uh, I was at a conference with some superintendents recently, and one of them was sharing with me uh, at dinner. Their challenge has been they've hired some great school leaders, but one of the things that they noticed, a trend that they've noticed is, uh, that those school leaders were really good teachers and really good with kids. Then they became an administrator and they continue to focus on kids as opposed to the staff as one, is that something you've noticed? And two, how do we help uh, those administrators recognize that like their, their new sole focus, you know, it's not, you don't care about kids, but it's just exactly what you said. Their, their job is to take care of the staff so they can love the kids better. And so what's some advice you have to help people break the paradigm of, I serve kids versus I serve the adults. Well, if that superintendent believes that, then that superintendent needs to preach it. And become That becomes the language. Yeah. Uh, years ago, I heard Marriott say the reason Marriott was the, the place to stay for years was because they said, we, our job is to work with the employees because the employees will take care of the guests. And so they really focus on how do we, Chick-fil-A is a perfect example. I mean, you walk into Chick-fil-A and it's, it's my pleasure. My grandson, I went to his fourth birthday party. I said, thanks for inviting me. He looked at me and said, it's my pleasure. I'm like, dude, you've been going to Chick-fil-A too much. But what is the language you want to hear from your staff? Well, if you as a superintendent or a director is constantly talking to your principals, vice principals, whatever. Hey, what are you doing this week to take care of your staff? How are you checking on your staff? What are you doing? If, if that becomes a language and that's, they, they think you're measuring us by how we're connected with the staff and then find every resource you have to support, to feed them. You know, there's an activity I like to do and I'll share it now so people might consider. It's just simply one at a time. And let's model it real quick. I'm going to tell you one thing about me. And then Dustin, you tell me one thing about you and we'll go back and forth for 30 seconds. It'll, it'll be interesting. So I love water. We go to the beach. I'm in the water. We go to the river. I'm swimming. So that's something about me. What about you, Dustin? Uh, I love when it's when it's cool outside. I love to either play golf with my sons or be hiking with my whole family somewhere uh, in St. Louis area. Yep. I'm the middle of five kids. I got away with everything growing up because, you know, the, the kids growing up in the 60s and 70s, man, it was streetlights, be home. And I was that middle kid. Yeah, I, I uh, had visions of being a Mickey Mouse Club 
uh, singer at one point, but, but realized when you went through auditions that you actually had to have talent. So I uh, focused on a different career. <laughs> yeah, I like to do crazy things. Like when I was in college, I hitchhiked around the United States, went through 26 states. One time I asked a woman to marry me after I only knew her nine days. And she said <laughs> no. So I asked her again six months later. We've been married for 37 years. So, yeah, I like to do crazy stuff. So. <laughs> I told my wife I loved her before we started dating. So there's that. <laughs> See, so that little activity called one at a time. Imagine every time you start a PLC, a department meeting, a grade level meeting, you just take five minutes as a group. Maybe there's five and you go around and one time it's, hey, what was the craziest job you had? Another time it's one at a time. Another time it was, hey, what is one area you wish you could get better at? And, and whoever's running the meeting just to maybe ask the question, but and what it does, it kind of grounds it. It creates a moment where we just take those few minutes to relax. Well, imagine you're the district administrator and you're trying to coach your principals to take more time to take care of the adults. Give them four or five of those. And there's millions of them all over the place. You can Google great questions to ask or quick activities. In my book, School Culture by Design, there are a half dozen of them that I just put in there. Pennies, another one. Give everybody a coin. They take a look at the coin and they tell the group what was something significant that happened the year that coin was minted. So maybe it's 2018. Oh, that was the year we and the story comes out. Well, that's that's something that I appreciate. It seems to be your hallmark is whether it's in your book or your blog or just listening to you. You're you're focused on practical advice that I can go implement today or tomorrow. And so that's something that is really refreshing. One of the questions I have that. Uh, you know, I see across the country in schools is that there's going to be a lot of folks, hopefully, that read your book this summer, that dive into your blogs, that dive into your podcast, and come with great ideas to kick off the year. Um, the challenge that I notice is sustainability. So how how do we get sustainable like within that that one year, right? Let alone the one year. How do we get sustainability for two, three, five years? of this culture of design what, what are some what's some wisdom that you have for that well one thought this year's the great migration i had a principal say teachers have never had the power and opportunities they have now because anywhere they go they can get hired he said five years ago if they left their job they may not get another job yep. within driving just to home well so think about this if you have 10 or 20 30 percent of your staff that's new in the last year or two really no one's been together that much the last couple of years Take the time to build community right off the start. You know, a lot of times, oh, well, we had a breakfast. Well, if you do a staff breakfast, you're going to go sit with your buddies anyway. Yep. So when you come out of the staff breakfast, then give people a table, mix the table up like that, and have them do some type of community builders for 30 minutes. And all of a sudden, a math teacher and a PE teacher and a band person are having a connection that might help them six months later when the band teacher and the football coach realize they plan their retreats on the same day. And they can now they have a relationship. They can come over and say, how are we going to do this so kids can do both? Oh, because that's a big deal in the country. Well, then if you are intentional, say, okay, we did that in August when we all came back. Well, let's do that again in October. Let's do that again in December. Let's do that again. Be intentional on building community. There's three levels of connection. One is an icebreaker. What you and I just did, bit of an icebreaker. You know, just fun little thing. It happened for a minute or two. But guess what happened? I want to find out more about those hikes or tell me more about your boys and golfing. It yeah. creates a conversation. We're used to icebreakers and team builders. Team builders, I give you some spaghetti noodles and some marshmallows. Let's build a tower. I'm like, slow down. You're in a hurry. We got to get a sense of people's personalities. But in between that is a thing called a relationship builder. It's, it's a conversation that allows us to create a sense of empathy and understanding. In a little bit longer conversation, I might tell you that my dad turns 88 next week. He started to lose his memory. I'm a little bit afraid because we lost my mom to dementia seven years ago. And so that's a deeper part. And you might go, wow, Phil, I can relate because my mom or my uncle or my, and all of a sudden I had shared that with someone, they gave me the book 36 hour a day, which was how to understand what a dementia patient's dealing with. That, that book was so invaluable to us. But I think if a staff feels like that person cares about me, we may never work together. They're teaching on one side of campus, but because we spent this time connecting and talking, now I feel like when they stand up in a faculty meeting and share an idea, I'm going to listen to them because I have a bit of a relationship. But deeper than that, there's a sense of empathy and understanding. And so the three levels, the first is icebreakers, just a little thing that takes us back to our seven-year-old self. It takes, you know, 
30 seconds to two minutes. The next thing is a relationship builder. I have a five or 10 minute conversation. You and I happen to be walking out to the car tomorrow. I say, hey, what course are you playing? Well, I can't because we're going out of town. But and this five minute walk becomes a little bit more connective. Yep. And every month we have, we have this engagement stage where we have to do some team building. We have to evaluate reading scores or lessons. And we're like, hey, you know what? Because we have this healthy relationship, we're willing for that engagement. That's that's so refreshing. I think one of the things that I, I, I come across is that um, so I your your people first mentality is something that uh, is just heartwarming, and I I hope plenty of educators rethink about how to go even deeper with that. But something that's even more powerful is, you know, I think if I were uh, back at one of my schools now, if we hadn't had this conversation or haven't dove into your work as much as I have at this point. I would think, all right, how do I create just an engaging school? It's exciting, getting involved. The theme that keeps coming up is this power of connections. And so it makes it a little bit less stressful in some ways, right? Like where I don't have to have this grand design as the leader. I just have to continue to be disciplined and intentional about building those relationships and those three levels. And those connections over time can help take our community to a whole different level. Is that an oversimplification or is that on the right track. Yeah. I think that's right. Right. Cause here's the deal. What I've come to realize is that we do a lot of professional development. We need to do professional development, but I think more educators learn more from their colleagues than they do from professional development. The best professional development, that person who's an expert in an area comes and works with you. But the best thing is when they say, okay, turn to your colleague and process it. Yep. Because I'm sitting there go, okay, with my third graders, I would do this, this, this. The person next to me might be dealing with seventh grade science. They go, well, I'm going to do this. You're like, that's brilliant. I hadn't thought of that. We get an idea from the front of the room from the professional development coach, and then we process it. Well, what happens is two weeks later, the PD is over, that coach is gone, yep. but my colleague is next door. Well, if I feel safe to go over there and say, would you watch me teach this lesson? It's going to be 20 minutes long. They come in and go, yeah, that was great. But if you had done this, or if you add this, sometimes teachers need to be validated. That was brilliant. Sometimes they need a little coaching to say, if you just adjusted this and they go, you're right. What the most, the coolest thing is, is when a teacher celebrates with another teacher goes, you're right. You talk about golf. How many times do you just look at your buddy? What am I doing wrong? He says, adjust your thumb and boom, the next hit. And you knew that, but you just forgot. Well, how many teachers, especially this next year, we're going to have so many people teaches on emergency credentials. And mm -hmm. if they just have someone who's safe, happens to be in the next room or across the hall that they feel like, could, could you just watch me for 10 minutes? Or how do you deal with a kid who's obstinate? And that person, well, I do this, this is, that's brilliant. I never thought of that. I think so much of education is engaging conversation between colleagues. Yeah. So I think, uh, uh, again, back to your superpower of connections, I think about, uh, I'm curious before I get to the rapid fire questions that we end every podcast with, what are, what are some of the critical elements of creating meaningful and lasting connections within my school. And so I think it's, is it the three levels? Is that as simple as that? If I stay focused on how do I use those three levels or is there any other deeper secret to it? You know what? I think if I'm an educational, educational leader, I, I just want to let people know I care and listen longer sometimes you know, Brene Brown, if you've read Atlas of the Heart, go to the very end of the book. There's this little cartoon piece about too many times as leaders. She was talking about corporate leaders and all that. When someone comes in, they want to be done with that meeting quickly. So, like, OK, that's good. Let's move on. Or, oh, it wasn't that bad. It's a brilliant, brilliant description of what we can do as leaders to be empathetic listeners and, and I can't explain it well enough in this time, but if you've got that book, a lot of people have it. It's really popular, Atlas of the Heart. Just go to the very back page, 271 to 274. It's brilliant. And it just taught, and when I shared that with educators, they're like, I've done that. I've done that. The other thing is put your phone down. When someone walks into your room, if they see you put the laptop, close it, they see you turn your phone upside down. That means the world to them because we're so used. To, don't think you can glance at your watch your little Apple iPhone <laughs> and someone not see that thing, they're going to see you glance at that text. And so if you want to build trust, that's what we need is that trust. And it's little things just as subtle as shutting the laptop when someone comes in and giving them total coming around the desk, sitting face to face with them. They're little things, but they're not simple things. And they mean so much to people. It's so funny you say that. I mean, I think, uh, 
even my wife, right. Who's my best friend in the world. She's got, I've got the Apple watch, but I never have the notifications on because it drives me absolutely bonkers, yep. but we'll be talking in a great conversation. I know she's fully invested, but because that thing beeps, she just looks at it. Right. And in my head, I'm like, what are we doing? Like, are we not having a conversation? And it's clear, like she is invested, but in my head, I'm like, oh, wait, is this not important to you? And so that's with my wife who I know cares, you know, let alone a professional setting where you're trying to figure out if someone cares, like, that can go, that can spiral out of control quickly, right? Now we all know she doesn't listen to these podcasts. Because so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's no way you share that story. But yeah, I think you're right. I think we've all been with someone um, and they looked at their watch a little bit longer than we would appreciate. I think as, as leaders, we have to think about those little things that we work so hard to build trust, those little things that break trust and we don't even know it. Yep. Uh, so, all right, we end every podcast the same way. Uh, what's a habit or habits that you use on a daily or weekly basis that help you be the best version of yourself? One thing I'm really working on is exercise. At my age, I just turned 60. I, I just, every day, Lori and I go for a walk, a mile and a half, two miles. Every day we read together. I read, we're reading a book by Martha Beck right now called Integrity. Um, and we've gone through so many books in the last couple of years. And so uh, those are two habits that we have that we share right now that uh, it's sharpening the, the saw, you know. Yeah, I like the reading together one. That's a good one. So speaking of reading, and you you gave one book, so you may give the same book again. What's a book you've either read recently or read over your lifetime that has been so monumentally impactful on you that you think other people really need to read it? Well, of course, Seven Habits is a successful person. But, no, um, but you know, Atlas of the Heart was the one I mentioned before. But Life is in the Transitions by uh, Bruce Feeler has been brilliant. Um, another one that I'm reading right now is called Strength to Strength. And it's the idea of how do you go from a strong career to a strong retirement and just brilliant. One of the things he says is we spend all this time preparing financially for retirement, but what are we doing for preparing for happiness so we feel happy and healthy? And so that's another one called, and I saw my young friends are reading because like, you're right. I, I just want to think about how do I have this healthy life? Yeah, that's great. Um, all right. So I don't know if you, uh, when you go on your walks, if your wife's not there, if you're listening to music or on drives, but I'm always, or when you work out and do other things, I'm always curious what people listen to in terms of music. So uh, what's, what's on your playlist if you're just bopping around somewhere? You know what? Uh, you know, I, I love Kenny Chesney. Um, I'm a country guy. I, um, you know, I just turn it high. Sometimes it's just something out of the, the, the seventies and eighties. I just love it. But one week we got to see Garth Brooks on a Saturday night and Vince Gill on a Monday. Both of those guys are incredible. One was in the Arco arena in Sacramento. The other was in the Ryman auditorium in Nashville. Mm. I love them both, man. But those, you know, Garth is crazy. He's all over the place. And Vince just stands there and, tells stories and plays the guitar. So those are my heart music. Well, those are great artists, one. But two, uh, like you said, the shows are really different, but the shows are just impact, uh, similarly impactful if you enjoy the music. And especially at the auditorium in Nashville. I think I've seen two concerts there. That's pretty awesome. It's a whole different place, man. Ryan, yeah. just, just versus being in a stadium with Garth, which is yeah. that's what Garth wants, man. He wants you screaming and yelling. That's awesome. All right. So uh, someone like you who's, uh, you know, engages on Twitter around educational leaders all the time. I'm just curious, uh, there's some advice that you've come across, whether it's in a conversation or social media or a book you've read that when you think about advising leaders in education right now, this is just a piece of advice that you just can't get off your brain and you want people to think about. You know what? I think that Lincioni, when he said, people don't spend time on culture because they think it's beneath them. That rocked me because I realized that at the end of the day, we all want to go home to a neighborhood where someone's friendly. Yep. Um, we want to go walk into a house where we feel safe. We belong. And I think that's what we can do in schools. And I, I heard that over and over. I lost my buddy, Tim Lyles, year and a half ago to cancer, 54 years old, amazing principal. And he just, he's the one just kept echoing, you know, we're changing the trajectory of kids' lives. 3,200 kids at a high school, 100% poverty. He's sending more kids to Fresno State University than anybody else in the country because he says, you know what? We love you. We care about you because we're going to change the trajectory of your life. And it starts with caring about them. And uh, I, that, that man lived that. And it was just, he's, he left such a 
a wake behind him of amazing, amazing caring. It's just started, and they, they, the data, the support was there because they loved him first. That's awesome. Well, Phil, I, I appreciate you one making time for us, but two having the courage to, and, uh, point people in the right direction of we are people first and we're professionals second. That's one of the reasons why we ask the question, what we do, like, who are you and what do you love about what you do? Cause that's more about like your passions and who you are and what you're about and less about the thing, because we're not, you know, and not, you know, you're an author, that's great. And a speaker, but you're way more than that. And that's what, that's where life happens. And so I just appreciate your courage, your focus and commitment to, uh, getting folks back on track of what matters in life. Yeah. Well, you know, I got to give a shout out to my friend, Jen Dustin, because <laughs> walking through her hallways when she was principal at Atlas and little kids shaking my hands, say, welcome to my class. And you know, all the habits that kids are learning now, my own grandson who goes to a little school in Baskin Ridge, New Jersey, I saw the habits out in front of the school. I'm like, cool. He's in the leader of me school. I had no idea. His parents are like, what does that mean? And I explained it like brilliant. And so, you know, the, the residue of what you guys are doing is just, fabulous. And uh, I just feel lucky to be a little part of uh, this school culture thing. So thanks for having me on. It's great. No, this is this is awesome. I appreciate I mean, uh, the best compliment I can give you in terms of a podcast is that I'm leaving rethinking how I build relationships and connections and people have always been really important to me. Um, but just little things that you just said that are so natural to you, as well as examples of what you can do, um, have me excited to get the heck out of my office and go start trying to interact with people differently. So I appreciate it very much. And go ask the target kid. What's his fun fact? And why yeah. that? <laughs> I that from Santa, man. It's a, uh, it's good stuff. So I, I, we, I may have to have your daughter on the podcast. And that's the same one who did the cookies and the lemon bars. Uh, on, I, man. she's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, clearly. We, she may have to be a future uh, guest just because uh, living through your stories of her, uh, we got to meet her. Yeah. And she's, she, she's on the phone. She runs our company and she's on the phone with six to eight educators every day. So you want to talk to someone who's in the guts of this thing. She would be a great interview. So give yeah. her a shot. All right. Well, we'll, we'll follow up. Well, Phil, thank you so much for today. This was awesome. I uh, wish you nothing but the best and hopefully we'll get a chance to cross paths again soon. I'll be looking forward to it. Thanks, Dustin. All right. Thanks, Phil. Please support us by subscribing to our YouTube channel, uh, podcast on Apple or Spotify, and help us celebrate the beautiful, messy work of shaping human potential. Mm-hmm.